Hello and welcome to the Epicenter Bitcoin, a show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Brian Farman Crane. As you know, back in May, we were in Amsterdam for the Bitcoin 2014 conference. While we were there, Sean Jones conducted a series of interviews with a number of people on the topic of cryptocurrency regulation. We think that given the recent European Banking Authority opinion paper warning uh, financial institutions to stay away from virtual currencies, this is an extremely appropriate time to release those very valuable opinions by these people and dive more deeply in this topic. This is the first episode of two episodes covering these regulation interviews. First, Sean talked to Brian Scarlatos. He's a tax lawyer based in New York, and he discusses the IRS tax position and how it compares to the regulatory situation in certain European jurisdictions. Then, Esteban van Gore, a Dutch tax lawyer specialized in VAT and gaming, talks about VAT rules in the Netherlands and Europe. Sean then talked to Jerry Brito. He's a research fellow at George Mason University. He's also the director of the Technology Policy Program. He talked about the regulatory situation in the US and also discussed a recent paper he wrote on Bitcoin regulation. The last interview is with Louis Quende. He's a young hacker and activist. He's an advisor to the European Commission and discusses the position of the EC with regards to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So this is Sean Jones, still in Amsterdam at Bitcoin 2014. I have Brian Scalatos with me. Uh, he's a tax lawyer, partner in Kostelanitz, uh Have I pronounced that correctly? Kostelanitz and Fink. You did. That's and um, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a mouthful. I, I can't promise to do that uh, if I've had a few drinks. I'm sorry. And you're going to be talking this afternoon about uh, tax. Um, I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to tell us a little about the theme of that talk. But I know that the tax has been a, a challenge for regular, well, tax authorities in pretty much every ju- jurisdiction. They don't know how to classify this thing that's cryptocurrency, that's Bitcoin. And it's only been in the last few months that um, tax authorities have started to come out with opinions. In the UK that I'm familiar with, uh, HMRC came out with a a briefing on the subject and broadly speaking, um, considered that for VAT purposes, uh, European sales tax, that it's um, it operates like money, so it, it should be considered like money, but in all other respects, it's it's like an asset. Now, in um, was it in March or, or, or April even that uh, IRS came out with their with their with their statement? It was in March when they finally got around to telling us what they're going to do with it. But of course, seeing you knew it had to happen, right? It's the same. Oh, goes. absolutely. It's like two things certain in life: death and taxes. We knew the taxes were coming. And and I suppose it's it's a good thing that taxes have now been clarified because a lack of clarity tends to make running a business very difficult. Right. Running a business or even just handling your personal affairs, if you've made some money on Bitcoin, for example, you didn't know what to do with it. And that's exactly why the IRS came out with this position in March, because people had to file their tax returns in the United States by April 15th. So a lot of, lot, lot of notice, plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, right. a lot of scrambling around in the last four weeks, that's for sure. Uh, I guess um, that there's also a difference in approach between the US and a European approach, certainly in the UK. In the UK, they said, okay, we have thought about this now and we've published our position and that is the position as it is going to be now. Um, technically speaking, that's how you should have treated it since the year uh, dot of, of Bitcoin. Uh, but... Uh, we'll, we'll look favorably on, on, on any reasonable excuse why you might have treated it differently since we haven't previously come out with a, 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 an approach uh, uh, on our tax treatment. I understand that in the U.S. it might not be quite so sympathetic. Is that right? Well, you know, it may not be so sympathetic, but if you hire a good tax lawyer. (laughs) Do you know (laughs) any? (laughs) As a matter of fact, I do. Um, So the point here is, is that if you say, listen, you just told me how you were going to tax it four weeks before my return was due. Uh, You know, you have to give me a break. I think that in most cases, the IRS will. I think what they really expect you to do, though, is go on extension for your April 15th tax return, get an additional six months, which you can do until October 15th, and then get it right for October 15th. 
But you know, the real question is, is not, that's for your 2013 return. The real question is not what are you going to do for 2013, but what if you made some money in 2011 or 2012? Exactly. You know what they're going to want? They're going to say you have to go back and amend your return and pay the taxes plus interest. So they're not being quite so lenient then. They, they, they're they expecting their pound of flesh. Oh, you should always. have known that this was going to be their <laughs> position. And and you should pay the taxes with the interest. Yeah, they always want, they're, they're going to want the money even mm -hmm. in 2012 or 2011. Does the new IRS... Um, publication, their, their statement on tax treatment, does that have some implications for the way in which you keep your records? Because I've heard here in Europe that, that the quite onerous um, in terms of capital gains, as we would call them in, in, in Europe, um, the profits that you've made on buying and selling, that, that you, you, you've you got to have pretty comprehensive records to, to, to know how to file your tax return. I think that's one of the real issues here. It's extremely complicated to keep the records that you need to file your tax return. And it's not just when you buy and sell the Bitcoin itself. One of the unusual things about the way the IRS treated it is they said every time you use it to get a cup of coffee, for example, that's treated as a sale of the Bitcoin. So you're going to have gain for just buying a cup of coffee. And so every time you transact, you're going to have to keep records of how much you paid for that portion of the Bitcoin and what it was worth at the time you converted it into the cup of coffee. And so the record keeping is actually very onerous. And very much against the sort of ethos of uh, micropayments that is one of the potentials for, for, for Bitcoin. And it really creates frictions around that. Um, now, at the same time, it creates opportunities. There are companies that are coming up with programs that will keep track of the spending of your Bitcoin and do the automatic conversions and produce the records. So as fast as the IRS can come up with regulations, the technology is you know, following in place to yes. do what they need. Yeah. So they're going to be wallets that you pay your Bitcoin from that'll keep track of uh, what you spent it on uh, and, and provide you with the information you need for your tax returns. Exactly. There are companies that have add-ons to those wallets that will just keep track of it all and then, I guess, spit out um, uh, all the data, which, as I say, again, will be a headache then for the accountants to go through. It's almost like if you're engaged in day trading, in and out of stocks, in and out of stocks, they will be able to track the in and out of Bitcoin on a daily basis as you make all your micro-purchases. And is that going to make... Um, adoption less attractive, do you feel? Adoption well, of, the, of the currency, of cryptocurrencies? I, if the technology is really good, I think it will help. But certainly, I think any friction like that will make it somewhat less attractive. But again, if the, um, the technology can keep pace and make it easy to keep track of, then it'll be a little bit easier. You know, so you can keep track of it, perhaps. But now you have the accounting fees. In the United States, most people have an accountant to prepare their tax returns. That accountant, if you purchased a lot of things with Bitcoin over the year, it may, he may charge you 5000 you know, dollars to go over and track everything. So that's a real friction. So we've got away from paying the rich bankers and we're now going to pay the rich accountants. There you go. I think it's the full <laughs> employment for uh, Accountants and Tax Lawyers Act. All oh, right. So tell me a little bit about the presentation that you're going to make uh, later on this afternoon. Well, what I want to do is I just want to give people a sense of how the IRS approaches tax principles. And the bottom line is, is because it is the IRS and they need all the money for the schools and bridges and roads and whatever else they spend money on, uh, they try to get taxes from wherever they can, of course, like every country. And there's some interesting concepts in the United States. For example, if you find gold in your backyard, that's going to be taxable to you. Or if somebody, you win the lottery, that's going to be taxable to you. And so those types of analogies could carry over into Bitcoin, mm -hmm. whereas if you're mining Bitcoin and you get Bitcoin, now that's going to be taxable to you. You've received something of value. And so they said when you mine it, it's taxable to you. And then when you spend it, it's taxable because you've now essentially sold it. And of course, if you sell it for cash, that's taxable. And if you receive Bitcoin for the payment of services, you're working and you get paid, that's going to be taxable. And the government says the person who pays it has to withhold withholding taxes. And also, in a little known fact about Bitcoin is it is subject to backup withholding. So if you're paying somebody from the United States and you're paying somebody in another country for services that were performed in the United States, you have to withhold 30% 
of the value of that payment. And so there are these frictions on the transfers of Bitcoin that, you know, is such a the special thing about Bitcoin. And there are very few frictions and you can transfer around the world. Now you can still do it, but you better track it. And there may be a lot of tax due because you do it. Do you feel that that's likely to drive Bitcoin underground? Or do you think that um, folks will just get on with it? They'll use their super apps that will keep track of all, the, uh, all of their spending and so on. Right. Um, so I don't know exactly how people are going to react. I think what they'll do is they'll get on with it and use their super apps. But maybe in the end, that would be better for Bitcoin. As it gains more legitimacy, maybe it loses some of the enthusiasm that's caused it to uh, grow so fastly, so quickly. But with the um, legitimacy comes a more widespread acceptance. Right. So you see positive rather than negative features of, of the IRS approach. In the end, it was going to be regulated and it was going to be taxed. So just knowing how it's going to work and having uh, the businesses and the software develop around it to make that easy is positive in the end. That's a very nice note to, to, to leave it on. Tax is positive. I <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a tax lawyer. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> well, that's your, uh, that's the bone bell. I suppose just to, 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 to wrap it up, um, now that things are clearer in, in, in the US on a tax, from a tax perspective, um, does that make the US an attractive place for Bitcoin startups? Or can you see some other jurisdictions that you would perhaps point a, a, a startup towards? Well, I think the United States is an attractive place for the reason I just said. Once you have, you, you're going to have regulation no matter what. And once you know what it is, that creates stability. And you need stability for any startup, for any business. And so you do have the stability in the United States. However, um, there may be certain jurisdictions that adopt a more lenient attitude, which would then have a lower tax rate. So if you know what the tax rate is going to be and you know what the system is and it's going to be less expensive in the United States, that may be a better jurisdiction because you can combine the stability with the lower cost. But for now, the United States is a good place. That's, a, that's an interesting thought. Well, uh, Brian Scalatus, thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts thank with you, our Sam. listeners today. Appreciate it. So this is Sean Jones, still at Bitcoin 2014 in Amsterdam, uh, day two. I've got with me at the moment Esteban Van Gogh, who's a tax lawyer, uh, or a, yeah. is that right? Tax lawyer here in, in the Netherlands, in Holland. Yes. And uh, if I understand correctly, you specialize in, in VAT and gaming as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a tax lawyer here, uh, working in the Netherlands. Uh, my specialization is uh, yeah, digital, so everything... What has to do with digital and uh, also connects with VAT, uh, I'm interested in that and I have a focus on that. So I'll always look uh, for uh, VAT implications occurring and uh, try to look what uh, what could be done to uh, solve problems for my uh, for my clients. So, yeah. Well, that, that, that VAT has been an interesting uh, challenge um, for most of the... EU member states. I mean, VAT itself is very much a, a European phenomenon, and VAT is, in principle, set um, at a, a Europe-wide. Uh, it's a Europe-wide tax in that sense, yeah. and flows down into the individual member states. Yeah. Uh, but the different member states have not necessarily uh, applied. Uh, Bitcoin um, VAT in the yeah. same way. Um, I know in the UK, which I'm familiar with, we um, had a, a, a very positive announcement about uh, two months ago, yeah. um, which which clarified the situation and meant that uh, VAT wasn't due. But what was the what's the position here in the Netherlands? Uh, like I think. First, to elaborate a little bit on, on VAT, uh, VAT is, 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 is in principle uh, based on, uh, on European uh, law. So it's secondary European law, uh, which is applicable throughout uh, the European Union. Um, it is not, it's, it's, it's based on a, on, on a regulation, so it's not a, a, a direct law. So member states are allowed to, uh, yeah, interpret certain things differently. So what you will see is currently, of course, there's no 
specific particular uh, provision with respect to Bitcoin. Uh, so member states are really looking into this and have different positions on, on, on that. So the UK had a good position, in my opinion, a very practical, mm. uh, VAT technical, I wouldn't agree with it all, uh, but here in the Netherlands, yeah, there isn't that much said about VAT. They are comparing via of uh, Bitcoin with a uh, local exchange uh, trade system, which is applicable here in, in, in Amsterdam. And that local uh, exchange trading system is exempt from VAT most of the times. Uh, but they do say, okay, as soon as you have a barter, uh, you must look at the economic value and still need to uh, to apply for VAT. And if you look within Bitcoin here in the Netherlands, yeah, currently there aren't any guidelines with respect uh, to VAT, except for that comparison, uh, which in my opinion is not correct. I mean, you should look a bit broader and should really look within Bitcoin itself. So what do you have? You have miners, you have uh, exchanges, you have Bitcoin transactions. And if you have a Bitcoin transaction, is that a Bitcoin to Bitcoin or is it a Bitcoin conversion in, in fiat? Those types of distinctions you can make uh, within VAT in order to look at like what is the, 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 the typical VAT treatment for this. Now, are you saying that here in the Netherlands, if you uh, buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin, you have VAT applied to the cup of coffee, do you yeah. also have VAT theoretically applied to the Bitcoin payment? Uh, so is it a barter transaction according to, to, to the Netherlands tax authorities? No, they, they, they aren't really uh, arguing about that. Like, I can be very honest, the tax authorities, they uh, filed their view on Bitcoin and maybe it's like half a page. And they refer to the LED system, so the local okay. exchange trading system. Um, I read through it, of course, but still not, a, not enough guidelines and Bitcoin is totally different. Um, yeah, if, if you look at the, 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 the normal tax treatment, if I buy a cup of coffee and I pay it in fiat money, of course, there's there's VAT on it. If I uh, consider to pay it in, in, in Bitcoin, in my opinion, still VAT is on it because I'm selling coffee, for example. Oh, yes, on the, on the coffee, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. But what about on the, uh, the exchange, the, uh, the, the mode of payment, yep. the Bitcoin? Uh, in the UK, before... HMRC came out with its uh, briefing. Mm -hmm. um, they were saying, although it wasn't fully clarified at the time, but they were saying that there was VAT on the Bitcoin that was used for pay in payment. So it was a barter transaction, and there was VAT on both sides. Yeah. Um, but you're saying that's not the case here in, in the Netherlands. No, so that's I'm, also pragmatic then. Here in the Netherlands, well, yeah, we have tax authorities which are really pragmatic. So in case they don't give any guidance, I always advise my clients to take a position in that, take a good position with um, some good arguments and then go to the tax authorities to rule. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, with respect to exchanges, if I would have an exchange as my client, uh, I would say that an exchange is almost comparable to a normal money exchange. Uh, every financial service is VAT exempt. So if I then look at it um, with it within the Bitcoin space, I think it, it, it isn't different. I mean, you're exchanging Bitcoin into other cryptocurrencies or you're exchanging Bitcoin into fiat money. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, you're still providing for uh, a financial service as an exchange, uh, even though Bitcoin is, is not a legal tender yet. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the pragmatism like, yeah. comes in because I know, again, in the UK, they say that uh, the HMRC tax authority in the UK says that it isn't money, mm -hmm. but it works like money. Yeah. And because it works like money for the purposes of VAT, it's treated like money. And uh, that's pragmatic. That's yeah. a sensible position. Um, I don't know whether that will last um, and maybe the situation in other member states, for example, here in the Netherlands, might well change. Do you do you feel that the Netherlands is a good place uh, for Bitcoin startups uh, from a tax perspective? Is this the, is this a good startup location? Yeah, I think from from a various type of perspective. So not only from tax. Um, yeah, I work a lot with startups, and normally yeah, startups come here to the Netherlands, specific to Amsterdam, of course, because the environment. You have a lot of well-educated people here. Uh, everybody speaks English, and of course, tax. Uh, the tax authorities are very open to discussion. So yeah, 
it's it's a good place to be uh, established here and uh, I mean you have a lot of uh, investors which also uh, interested in analysis is a, is a clear gateway to Europe so it's uh, it's yeah besides the tax related uh, uh, aspects there are also a lot you, of other you, you make a very good advertisement for, for Holland for, yeah. for, for startups <laughs> and, and and presumably the tax position is also um, very encouraging and certainly the VAT one is yeah. is 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 on the right side there are still other jurisdictions that make VAT a problem at this point in time I and mean, yeah. that might change do you see a situation where we will get a, a harmonized approach to uh, VAT and taxes uh, within the European Union? Um, yeah, the interesting question because uh, my PhD is about, about European VAT and digitalization. Uh, our, what I will include in my PhD is look broader. I mean, the digital area is not only Europe, it's internationally. And if I look at Bitcoin in one of my articles, I call Bitcoin a super currency, mm-hmm. meaning our current uh, digital needs. And in my opinion, it's still what it is. So if we look at legislation, of course, we can look within Europe whether we can harmonize it, but it will be better if the OECD uh, would like uh, go uh, have a look at more global uh, treatment on digitalization and part of it is Bitcoin. And they're already looking into it. So virtual currencies, uh, yeah, even though I don't like to call it a currency, but I just call it a currency for this uh, for this interview, uh, virtual currencies are uh, already included in uh, in some research done by, by the OECD. And I hope they will give clear guidance uh, internationally uh, on, on this topic. Mm-hmm. So that, that not only Europe is harmonized, but it would be on a global level and that would really help uh, uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies going uh, going mainstream. Of course. Uh, so, which other jurisdictions uh, would you say are particularly good for Bitcoin startups apart from the Netherlands? Yeah, apart from the Netherlands, uh, yeah, really. Like w- within Europe, you can also also look at maybe some other um, non EU considered from a VAT perspective uh, countries, such as Isle of Man or uh, Gibraltar. Uh, other typical member states. I mean, Germany, they have some clear guidance. I mean, in Germany, it's not considered to be a legal tender, but they treat it equal as as e-money. And that's good because then you can have, uh, you, you, you can, you will need to apply for a license of, uh, for, for financial, uh, for providing financial services. That can give you some certainty, but you will need money because that's around 700K to get that license. Uh, VAT perspective there, it's that it's exempt. So they all, they give clear guidelines. But yeah, really within within Europe, I think more on like the yeah, like I already said, like Gibraltar or or Isle of Man. But I I, I would rather advise people to uh, to look at the, at the member state and not only like from a tax perspective or regulatory perspective, but really what what can you do there? Because tax and regulatory can be solved if you have a good lawyer. Um, but I mean. Grow, business growth that's the most important thing so do you have a lot of people around you uh, which can help you with, with innovation you have a lot of developers walking around there and if you flying in developers are they willing to live there um, so yeah I think that those are also considera- considerations which you will uh, need to take into account actually that's very practical advice um, not just to, to take into account the tax and regulatory aspects yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing those thoughts with us and uh, no our listeners problem. on Epicenter Bitcoin. No problem. Thank you, Esteban. Thank Bye-bye. you. So, Sean Jones, still here uh, in a very sunny Amsterdam for Bitcoin 2014. We're into day two. And I have Bitcoin's leading academic, well, the leading academic on cryptocurrencies <laughs> sitting opposite me now, Jerry Brito. Jerry is Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center, which is, as I understand it, part of George Mason University, which is, which part of the States? It's in D.C., so it's actually in Virginia, uh, right. But right across the, the river from D.C. It's where it all happens yeah. government city yeah. and you're a professor of law at george george An mason professor oh i'm so sorry that's that, right. is, have i under understated no, no, you've overstated overstated. oh that's fine <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll 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 leave that one stand then uh you're a podcaster yourself yes. you are a blogger and uh, definitely an opinion former uh you've written 
on, uh, well, you wrote a, a wonderful primer about a year and a bit ago for policymakers that I think was then used and you were taken up on it um, and, and invited to, to, was it, have I got the expression right, to testify. testify? Yeah, before the sound so yeah. Sounds so criminal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, the, the primer um, was important, I think, because at that point in the States, the, the regulators uh, were starting to ask questions and there was no one document, no easy place where they could go to for, for some level-headed uh, sort of discussion of the technology and its potential implications for policy. Uh, and so we, we wrote it. It was, I mean, you know, I'm glad uh, that it got a great reception, but there wasn't much to it except explaining in a in a uh, sort of level-headed and, and uh, manner for a layperson what Bitcoin is and uh, sort of pointing out the obvious places where uh, policy would touch. And and it did the job. And of course, in this, you you co-wrote it with Andrea with Andrew Castillo. Yeah. And you've recently written a, a new paper, and we'll, we'll we'll come on to that um, uh, in in a, in a few minutes. But but tell us about um, that when you were asked to testify to sure. to the, to the to the U.S. Senate, because this was the first thing, wasn't it, that, mm -hmm. that happened in the States? So this was after uh, FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is an agency of the Treasury Department, which um, deals with uh, money laundering uh, regulation and terrorist financing regulation. Uh, they had already issued their guidance. Uh, so that was really the first uh, major uh, regulatory action on Bitcoin. But the Homeland Security Department, uh, Department, not Department, the uh, uh, committee in the Senate uh, uh, has sort of taken the lead at looking, uh, basically having oversight over the agencies that are regulating Bitcoin. And they decided to have an investigation and the, the report of that investigation uh, should be released soon. Uh, as part of that investigation, they interviewed a lot of people. Um, and I was one of them. And I think having the primer out there, um, uh, you know, sort of got us in the door, uh, as it were. Um, and then I was asked uh, to testify, um, uh, which, again, by the time you're testifying, um, you've already shaped a lot of the uh, uh, opinions I, you, you probably imagine. Um, did they read it beforehand and then have questions for you, or did they they, oh, they, they, they wing it? I guess what I mean is that um, by the time you have the actual uh, hearing with the testimony, you've met with uh, the committee staff many, many times. Um, and so you've already had long discussions about the implications. And so the testimony kind of gets it on the record. I see. So you, you actually have a dialogue beforehand. Oh, sure. with, and, and, and they were getting to understand, getting to grips with it, as we would say. I think so, yeah. I, I, there are very few surprises uh, at, at these <laughs> well, hearings. Good. And did you find the Senate yeah. receptive? Absolutely. I think that... Um, uh, Senator Carper, who's the chair of the uh, Homeland Security Committee, um, has shown great leadership on, on Bitcoin. He understands that there are challenges that the government's going to face, especially law enforcement's going to face with Bitcoin. But the more importantly, there are a lot of potential benefits to Bitcoin. Um, and it's very refreshing to see uh, policymakers focus on the benefit side of the equation. Uh, not just on the cost side of the equation, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's very good because I mean, at, at, at the at the outset, um, there were some uh, some sort of some rhetoric coming from from other senators <laughs> that that was that that only focused on the cost side, and so it's good that Senator Carper has sort of shown that leadership, and I think he has brought along some of his colleagues who today. You know, they, they sort of want to uh, say that they, they've never uh, been skeptical about Bitcoin, which, oh. is, which is fine. We'll believe them. Well, we have a kind of view in Europe, I think, that in the States, it's a, it's a sort of shoot first and ask questions mm -hmm. later uh, approach. And in Europe, we, we have a more measured approach and we consult and we find out and especially in the European Union there's a, an awful lot of consultation mm -hmm. uh, before we say anything you know you can't right. but you, you you just simply can't draw anyone in any official position or any um, legislator to, to to say anything about it because they don't know about it they don't want to be seen to, right. to, to, to where I've, you've had some fairly vocal sure uh, so I think that has to do <laughs> with uh, the different structures of our governments right and and in the US of course you have um, you have a party system 
but ultimately, it is uh, individual members, individual politicians who uh, people are voting for. Um, and so they have their own brand uh, okay. that they have to, to burnish. And, and so some uh, folks want to make a name for themselves. Um, and so, uh, yes, they will speak out uh, even when they don't know uh, all the facts, right? So a regulator who, who is a civil servant probably won't do that kind of thing. Exactly. But, but an elected official probably would. Uh, even when you have appointed officials who have aspira- other aspirations in the future, they might still... Uh, uh, you know, we wouldn't be thinking stuff. about New York here, would we? Well, I think it's interesting what happened in New York. Um, so the banking regulator there, um, when he entered, who, by the way, <clears throat> if you think about back to uh, who was it? that had this harsh rhetoric about Bitcoin only being good for uh, illegal transactions, only good for money laundering. It was uh, Charles Schumer, who's a senator from New York. And um, the banking regulator uh, in New York is a protege of Mr. Schumer, uh, uh, who's former, formerly uh, on his staff, et cetera. So it's interesting that um, this is Benjamin Lasky, who is a bank- banking regulator. When he came out, um, he came out pretty aggressively, uh, announcing an investigation, and it was aggressive because rather than saying we're going to have an investigation, we'd like to meet with all these folks. Here's some letters inviting you to our offices to <laughs> chat. He issued subpoenas, which are you're compelled to um, to respond, which was a bit aggressive. Um, but did you get one? No, no. I did not. <laughs> um, so it was mm, uh, basically companies that were uh, involved in the okay. Bitcoin space. Also, interestingly, investors in the Bitcoin space, which is really, really dangerous, I think. Um, uh, because think about it. If you are investing um, in GE, and then GE comes under investigation for something, you're just an investor. You, you did not direct yeah. the company. So uh, it really would put a chill in, in, in the capital markets if you were going to get a subpoena, a subpoena for investing in a, in a company. But let's put that aside. So he was very aggressive at first. Since then, I think he has moderated a lot. And I think that he... Um, he's understood that there are two ways you can make a name for yourself related to Bitcoin. <laughs> One could be I'm going to be the tough law and order type who is going to put an end to money laundering and whatever else that's happening. Or you could say I'm going to be the first to completely normalize Bitcoin and bring that innovation to New York State. So it got everybody's attention mm-hmm. with the heb- headline grabbing stuff at the beginning uh, with the subpoenas and uh, I, that's maximum I impact. I can't like. read his mind um, and so I, you know, I've never spoken to him about it um, but I, I wonder if he thought that this was a clear cut case of really this, this can only be used for not the best of things uh, and then once he started learning about it he said oh you know the, the The play here is to uh, become the first state to make this, uh, um, you know, sort of embrace this innovation and bring all of that. So he switched story partway through, but it looks like it's part of something that's sort of continuous. Uh, You know, I I couldn't say that, right? So I I don't know what his story ever was. Okay, (laughs) Okay. I I won't draw you more on that. But it is interesting. The the, the proposal, I understand, is for something called a bit license, or is that just a nickname that's been given to this thing? So, yeah, that's the name that he has used. Um, And, in fact, I think people have been invited to apply apply for a bit license, even though there is no application process. (laughs) Um, uh, But, yes, so... In the U.S., if you're going to start a uh, money transmission business, right? So you're, you're somebody who is uh, helping customers send money from point A to point B. You have to be licensed, and it's not just one federal license. You have to get a license in each of, uh, of 50 states. Not really 50 states. It's actually 48 states that require um, a license, it, which is a real hurdle uh, if you are a small startup because before you can begin. You know, operating on day one, you have to have acquired 48 licenses, mm-hmm. which is very expensive, very time consuming. Um, and today, uh, it's not clear how uh, Bitcoin fits into the licensing uh, schemes. Um, and so the different states are looking at these and developing uh, new guidance, sometimes even new laws legislatures are going to have to promulgate. Um, and so in New York, what they're thinking about is rather than try to issue guidance that tells you how the existing money transmission licensing applies to a Bitcoin business, we're going to create a whole new thing called a bit license, which is an interesting choice of, of name because, you know, it, it has, it sounds like Bitcoin. Of course, Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency. Um, uh, and so there are certain, there are certain things, but there's good and bad to that, right? So, so the bad is why are we creating a new 
scheme for uh, a technology that ultimately does the same thing. It sends money from point A to point B. Why are we regulating this thing in a specific way? This is a technology-specific regulation. And when you do that, that's, that could be dangerous because if you want to kill a technology, there's no better way than to make it impossible to to operate uh, in a space. So that's the fact that we see a technology-specific regulation as opposed to technology-neutral regulation, just regulation on money transmission, doesn't matter what technology you're doing, that's worrying. On the other hand, they might have a good point for why they want to do a bid license. Um, the money transmissions law in New York, from what I understand, is very antiquated. And it would be very difficult, and, uh, and it would, there would take a lot of time to try to modify that law. So, for example, um, as a money transmitter, you have to um, there, there are certain, only certain number of permitted, uh, permissible investments that you can make with the money that you have in custody for your customers. So, these are very you know, highly secured bonds, cash, etc. Well, what about Bitcoin? Is is Bitcoin a permissible investment? It's not. If you look at the law, you you can't hold Bitcoin. But of course, if you're a Bitcoin business, you have to hold Bitcoin. So you're sort of put in this in this catch twenty two. Creating a bit license might alleviate some of that. So it's a it's it, it, from your point of view, it's a pragmatic, a potentially pragmatic solution. I think that's what they're doing. It's interesting. Is there any precedent for a, a technology specific uh, regulation? Uh, um. There are, but they're not happy ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go on. Uh, so I'm thinking of uh, a voice over internet protocol. Uh, if you think about VoIP, when VoIP first um, b- began to be developed, um, the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission, the communications regulator, uh, didn't know what to do with it because it did not fit into any of their existing buckets. It allowed for telephonic communication, but it was impossible for this technology to comply with some of the requirements of, of telephony. So, for example, having an emergency call number, having number portability, have all these things that have been written to law, never imagining that there would be this new technology that allowed for telephony without, you know, and so the FCC um, uh, sort of uh, uh, undertook a proceeding to try to figure out what they were going to do and how they were going to squeeze this new technology into their existing um, and the bottom line is, is that the companies who wanted to develop uh, VoIP technology uh, but sort of waited for the FCC to issue uh, guidance or rules on how to do this, uh, basically they're still waiting. The FCC has never done that. Okay. And the companies who decided we're just going to build it, like Skype, built it. And it exists. And then on a case-by-case basis, they have um, made determinations about what requirements. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's... It's not always always helpful. So you've written a new paper um, in conjunction with Andrea as well. Andre Castillo, yes. And somebody else this time. Uh, Human Shadab. And Mm -hmm. Human is a uh, professor at New York Law School, and he's an expert on uh, financial markets regulation. Ah, so the focus of your new paper is on... Bitcoin financial regulation. Mm-hmm. So the first wave of regulation um, related to Bitcoin was about Bitcoin as a payment system. This is what we've been discussing. So that includes the consumer protection uh, uh, aspects of it, which is what Benjamin Lasky and the, the state level licensing deals with. And that also has to do with anti-money laundering and terrorist financing, which is what uh, FinCEN and the Treasury Department deal with. So that was the first wave. The, oh, this is, this is a new way of transferring money new way of making payments, consumer protection, anti-money laundering. The next wave of regulation that I see uh, coming forward has to do with uh, Bitcoin securities, Bitcoin derivatives, um, but then also Bitcoin denominated securities, Bitcoin denominated uh, derivatives, and then more interesting to me personally uh, are prediction markets and also gambling and any other kind of decentralized markets. Uh, this is going to be quite – some of it is pretty easy, I think. Uh, yeah, it's going to be easy work for regulators to to look at, um, you know, a, a Bitcoin uh, forwards contract. I think the, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission is, is not going to have a difficult time dealing with that. Um, because you're not talking about the Bitcoin itself. You're talking correct. about the, the instrument. Correct. Uh, and, and so – the rules already exist. The rules exist. already exist, right? Yeah. Um, but then when it uh, c- 
comes to a decentralized market or a Bitcoin denominated instrument or something like a prediction market, um, I think it's going to get uh, uh, much more complex and it's going to be very interesting for those of us who find these kinds of things interesting. Mm. And I guess also the whole idea of decentralized um anything mm -hmm. um, thinking perhaps beyond bitcoin to yes. smart contracts yes. uh, uh, distributed autonomous corporations and organizations yes. and so on Th admittedly we're we're at a very early stage yes. of, of of that but they're going to present some very interesting challenges because there's no issuer there's no um, legal person there's right. no uh, organization in the traditional right. sense. There are no intermediaries. Mm. This is the important thing. Mm. So regulators um, have depended on uh, uh, on intermediaries to enforce their rules. They enforce their rules against the intermediaries. And if you take away the intermediaries, who are you left to enforce against? It's the end parties and the users of the contracts. And the issue there is that that's much more costly. Just arithmetically it's going to be more costly mm -hmm. because where, where before you could uh, have regulated or enforced against a handful of intermediaries now you've got uh, you know hundreds or thousands of, of end users that you would have to uh, to go after um, I think the the relative comparison there um, or, or the uh, yeah, the comparison there might be something like what happened uh, after BitTorrent mm -hmm. right so Napster was an intermediary that facilitated file sharing um, it was easy to go after Napster and shut it down, but within months you had peer-to-peer uh, -peer decentralized file sharing emerge, culminating in BitTorrent, which is what we use today, and uh, there's no shutting BitTorrent down. So if you couldn't go after the intermediary, who did you go after? And we saw the recording industry go after end users, and they sued thousands of end users, but that didn't work. And I, I know in the UK there's an attempt to control the uh, ISPs, the internet service providers, right. as the gatekeepers of the yes. internet. Yes. There's some interesting analogies there, aren't there? I think so. Uh, yeah. Going for the gatekeepers and, and making them responsible, liable um, uh, for, for managing um, other people, their customers, right. uh, file sharing. Um, interesting times. And then, of course, new technologies on the on, on the emerging. We saw just two weeks ago, I think, um, a fundraising for MadeSafe, mm -hmm. um, a kind of distributed internet. Mm -hmm. I maybe making we'll that over, 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 <laughs> oversimplifying that, but but just you know that the the idea is certainly then there is no sort of central point. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you you now haven't even got users anymore in the conventional sense right um, interesting times we, we absolutely face. so as you like prediction markets yes because you got you, you smiled when you were talking about them. <laughs> uh, something our listeners won't picked up on but you're obviously very excited by them so uh, how about some predictions for the regulation of, uh, of Bitcoin uh, where, where are we going to be in uh, 12 or 36 months um, I don't think we're going to be um I don't think there's going to be uh, much more movement. Uh, we might see some more clarifications related to tax treatment. Um, I don't. It's hard for me to predict, right? <laughs> Ultimately, you, 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 the, the beauty of prediction markets is that you can uh, you can bet with your with, you, know, you can put your money where your mouth is, and if everybody does that, you can get a gauge a good probability of different outcomes. Um, uh, but if I had to, if I had to bet money, I don't think the the, the CFTC, which is a commodities regulator or the commodities contract regulator, is going to do much there. I think the SEC. Um, I think we will see more enforcement actions. We've already seen some. This is the Securities and Exchange Commission. That's correct. And uh, today you see um, some essentially what what are initial public offerings denominated in Bitcoin, um, and so uh, companies are making RPOs issuing shares um, in a completely unregistered way. Um, and that's against the law. Uh, whether you like that to, you know, whether you would hope that's the case or not, you know, uh, let's put that aside. The fact is it's against the law and I think we will see more enforcement actions. So mm -hmm. the trend in Shavers case was an, an obvious uh, Ponzi scheme, it seems like. Um, 
uh, but I but there are others where uh, we may see some some enforcement of, of what really uh, maybe are completely legitimate companies, but just did not follow the rules. Mm. So you, you you you've done a very good job of not sort of laying your name down to a uh, specific prediction there, uh, <laughs> um, because that we we always love that because we can come back and revisit it right. with you and then say ah, oh, but you said this. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, Jerry Brito, for sharing your time with us this afternoon. That's been really lovely, and I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed that my pleasure thank you so this is Sean Jones still at Bitcoin 2014 in Amsterdam I'm on uh, day two and I'm sitting next to Luis Cuende, um, who is uh, perhaps a, a, a very different kind of regulatory um, interviewee for me because uh, Luis uh, comes from Hackerspace. And um, I think you were awarded the best hacker in Europe under 18 when you were only 15 years old. Yeah, that was that was great, yeah. And how, how did you get into Bitcoin? What took you there? So I'm a big believer of free software um, so I got to know Bitcoin like three years ago or four years ago uh, almost when it was kind of born uh, well a bit later um, and first I was kind of a skeptic uh, but then I got uh, through the protocol and the peer-to-peer network and I, I love peer-to-peer I love free software so it was my natural love that was your sort of natural place to be and then you engaged with it yeah. so you have um, a rather unique space in um, in the uh, in European institutions uh, because, uh, and I presume because of your award when you were only fifteen, you you got some visibility, and um, uh, the European Commission reached out to you, and I believe you're an advisor to uh, Neely Cruz, who's uh, one of the commissioners, and I believe vice president of the commission at the moment. Um, I'm kind of interested in, and I'm sure our listeners will be, in finding out from you a little bit how receptive the European Commission is and the, the sort of uh, rather stuffy founda- uh, you know, um, uh, in, uh, institution of, of Europe, the, the, the bureaucracy of Europe, how that's engaged with, with Bitcoin. And uh, maybe you can give us some insight on that. Yeah, well, um, it's kind of complicated because uh, Bitcoin is a space that is moving really fast and, and the European Commission is not moving that fast, uh, to be frank. Um, but I think that Neely really likes, um, you know, the internet really likes uh, startups. And Bitcoin is in the startup space. So she kind of um, likes it. The problem is that, you know, um, the European Commission as any government in this planet has some very uh, intrinsic roots with the, you know, the banking system, the financial system right now. Mm-hmm. Um, um, a big part of the, fin- the financial system is not kind of understood Understanding that Bitcoin is an opportunity and not um, a dangerous thing, so so I think we we, we have to wait uh, two through to three or five years I don't really know uh, to see like the European Commission and, and Europe totally open to Bitcoin um, because right now. They are kind of seeing it as an opportunity, but also as a danger. Um, and when everybody starts seeing it only as an opportunity, then the European Commission will be more receptive, I think. Mm-hmm. So I, I think what you're saying is they're, uh, they're interested, but they're not fully engaged yet at this stage. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just like, like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that Europe sees, or the European institutions, see uh, an opportunity for what's known as regulatory arbitrage you know um, if other jurisdictions um, perhaps most notably the the US take a a more restrictive approach in their regulation that this actually is an excellent opportunity for for Europe I think it is Um, also uh, if you have been following the all the laws um, about Bitcoin Bitcoin in the US, they have a very complicated uh, situation right now. Where here in Europe, um, we got a lot of legislations, but 
we can i mean you can operate um using a bank uh, license for example for a bank partner uh, you can operate in the whole eurozone mm -hmm. and that's really cool i mean in the us you have to get a license from each of the states that's kind of crazy so that's a huge advantage that we have here in europe um but we have to exploit it obviously yeah. and we have SIPA transfers as well that are way better than the hth transfers and they have in the us uh so yeah we have we have the tools so europe is going to be um uh, uh, and some people already think it is um a, a better um area in which to to start a bitcoin business yeah indeed. and um long may it continue i would say um, do you have any predictions for for Bitcoin in 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 the EU? Do you have any insight into how that's actually going to pan out? You said three to five years. Do you, do you know something we don't know? Yeah, well, um, I think three to five years is like mass adoption, maybe, and and you know, um, thinking about Bitcoin as something good and not something risky, uh, as some of they think right now. Um, but I also heard that they are working on a document with some, let's say, not laws, but propositions of how to regulate Bitcoin in in all of the Eurozone. And that will be out, I think, in June. This is the uh, European Banking Authority, the EBA, that, uh, that's yeah, planning that. Yeah, that's it. Yes. That's it. Yeah, we, we had um, one of the panelists uh, on the first day of uh, Bitcoin 2014 uh, was from the European Banking Authority and uh, yes I think they're, they're saying uh, within a couple of months they yeah. will have uh, published their approach. Yeah, so, so that's really cool and also um, not only from the law perspective I think from the startup perspective we will start seeing more and more ventures uh, because I mean when the US VCs get in and invest serious money then the European VCs will follow um, and the VCs from the US are investing serious money already. Mm -hmm. uh, you only have to see BitPay's uh, 30 million. 30 million, yes. Yeah, 30 million, so that's odd. So European VCs will follow and, and, you know, more money, more startups, more innovation, so that's really cool. Now, if I understand correctly, you're uh, you're starting up something yeah. new yourself and, and you're moving to Switzerland, so you're you're moving out of, <laughs> out of the European Union into yeah. uh, an EEA country so sort of a half and half yeah yeah so um yeah so i think one of, of the things we lack here in in europe is a serious exchange um i won't be saying names but the two uh, most used exchange in in europe uh, that have more than the 70 percent market share uh, are in a gray zone so they are not compliant mm -hmm. um, one of them is kind of illegal so uh, and we want to fix that so we just raised um, 1.3 million euros from the biggest Italian VC um, and we are moving to Switzerland to start something serious that that makes you know Europe um, because we are we think that an exchange is the base of all the Bitcoin economy I mean then you can build wallets on top of it you can build you know a European bit pay for example on top of it so, so uh, but we want to get the basis right. We want mm -hmm. to make something perfect, mm -hmm. and that is serious. And and is Switzerland a better place to do business from at the moment? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, mostly because of the laws there, and because of the financial innovation they have there. I mean, it's the land of money, and that's that's pretty clear. And, and they live uh, off financial sector, so mm -hmm. so that's that's the place I think. And they also have a very strong relationship with the European Union. Yes. So so that, I think that's the place. You, yeah. you have the best of both worlds when you yeah, yeah, operate exactly. in, in yeah. Switzerland, yeah. indeed. And does your project have a, a name yet, or is that something? you're not releasing right now it is called bit -Syrix. that means bitcoin serious exchange uh, <laughs> so that's yeah that's uh, really and we are launching in the end of the year so i think our listeners will be watching this space and uh, <laughs> watching out for you and uh, your new exchange from switzerland uh, towards the end of this year watch this space Luis. thank you very much for for sharing your time with us today thank you you're welcome So we hope you enjoyed this episode about regulation. We'd like to thank Sean Jones for her excellent work in capturing these very valuable opinions. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider tipping us at epicenterbitcoin.com tips. 
You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter at epicenterbitcoin.com slash newsletter. And of course, uh, you know, follow us on Twitter at epicenterbtc. BTC.